Welcome to another episode of Standing on God's Word. In today's discussion titled Partakers of Sin, I delve into the importance of not partaking in other sins. Drawing inspiration from Ephesians 5, 6-7, this episode takes a critical look at modern situations where Christians may be pressured to conform to societal norms that conflict with our beliefs. I share my views on issues such as addressing gender identity, controversial collaborations within the faith community, and political affiliations. Through biblical examples like Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, as well as others, I illustrate the significance of standing firm in faith and not compromising on God's teaching. Join me as we explore what it truly means to live a life set apart in adherence to God's word. Stay tuned. Ephesians 5, 6-7 Let no man deceive you with vain words. For because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Be not ye therefore partakers with them. I came across a video on social media where the teacher was discussing the fact that she was addressing one of her students as a female, even though he was born male. She stated that she was a Christian, but out of respect, she was going to address him the way he wanted to be addressed. Of course, in the comment section, you had those defending and applauding her. But on the other hand, you had those like me who were coming against it. I made the comment that we are not supposed to be partakers of other people's sin. As usual, there were those that came against me, which is not surprising. Comments saying, oh, well, you should respect other people's wishes. We're not supposed to offend anyone. Jesus didn't offend anyone. What Bible are you reading? Jesus absolutely offended people. That's exactly why they wanted to kill him. Well, I'm a preacher's kid. I know the Bible. Okay, Ian. Exactly what does that prove? Since you know the Bible, then you know that it says that it is sharper than a two-edged sword. Why do you think that the Pharisees and others wanted to kill Jesus? Her response was, he wasn't preaching to them. Excuse me, what? Who was Nicodemus? As a matter of fact, Why were they being offended when they found out that he was actually referring to them in his parables? After giving her scripture after scripture, there was nothing left for her to say. Come on now, preacher's kid. PK, you should know what the word says. This is nothing new, though. People will always find a way to justify sin, even sin that is not their own. It's one thing to go to hell for your own sin. It's another thing to go to hell because you partook in someone else's. This pretty much goes for every area in life. Years ago, I spoke out against Tasha Cobbs collaborating with Nicki Minaj. I spoke out against Snoop Dogg and Kanye when they so-called went gospel. I spoke out against T.D. Jakes years ago. When it came out that he was actually partying with Diddy. Again, I was talked about and called judgmental. The excuse is always that Jesus sat with sinners. Absolutely. But he did not conform to their ways. He preached repentance. And for those that wouldn't accept it, guess what? He kept it moving. In Matthew 13 and 58, it says, And he did not many mighty works there because of their unbelief. He didn't beg them. They didn't accept it. He kept it moving. James 4 and 4, Ye adulterers and adulteresses. Know ye not that the 
friendship of the world is enmity with God. Whosoever, therefore, will be a friend of the world is the enemy. Catch that. The enemy of God. 2 John 1, 10 through 11. If there come any unto you, and we're talking about these false pastors, false leaders, false prophets, and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither bid him Godspeed. For he that biddeth him Godspeed is partaker, okay, partaker of his evil deed. It's election season, and once again, people are walking around with blinders on. I've mentioned before that God has shown my mom Obama years ago before he was even elected, okay? She warned my family, those that said they were saved and sanctified, not to vote for him. She told them that God was not with him. One of them got smart and said, well, you don't tell me who to vote for. Obviously, they had to come back and acknowledge that she was right. Since then, we have continued to warn people that we are not supposed to have our hands in this wicked government. How can you say you love God, but vote for those that go against his word? And that goes for the Republicans and the Democrats. Well... I'm voting for the lesser of two evils. Evil is evil. There is no in-between. They uphold the very things that God calls sin. How can you vote for a candidate that supports abortions and homosexuality on Tuesday, then turn around and shout all over the church on Sunday? Do you really think that God is pleased? This is years ago, but where I'm from, it used to be a dry county. You literally had to drive to a different county to buy alcohol. I have a relative that's supposed to be saved and sanctified and say he a preacher now. He is a representative for the district. Now, mind you, years ago, and this was probably before I was even born, my aunt was telling him that he didn't need to be in politics. But anyway... I was in KFC waiting to place my order while the people in front of me were discussing their displeasure. As a matter of fact, they were talking about him like a dog. How could he do that? Isn't he supposed to be a Christian? He supported it. He wanted to bring alcohol into the city. Now, mind you, at the time, I wasn't saved. And I started to been bust them and be like, yo, that's my uncle. But I didn't. I just called my mom later on and told her what happened. Of course, you have those that try to combat what we say, trying to use examples from the Bible, such as Daniel. They seem to forget that, yes, Daniel was a part of the wicked government, but he did not take part in their corruption. So let's look at the story of Daniel as well as the three Hebrew boys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. In Daniel chapter 1, the king of Babylon has besieged Jerusalem. This was Jerusalem's punishment for being disobedient to God, so he allowed them to be in the hands of King Nebuchadnezzar. The king told the master of the eunuchs, that he should bring certain of the children of Israel and of the king's seed and the princes, children without blemish, well-favored, skillful in wisdom, cunning in knowledge, understanding science, those that had the ability in them to stand in the king's palace and whom they might teach the learning and the tongue of the Chaldeans. The king had made daily provisions for them of his meat and wine. He nourished them for three years so that at the end they might stand before the king. This is when we are introduced to Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. 
But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat, nor with wine which he drank. Therefore, he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. God had brought favor upon Daniel with the prince of the eunuchs. He said unto Daniel that he was afraid that he would be endangered to the king if he saw that Daniel was worse off than the others. So Daniel gave him a proposition. He asked to let them have pulse to eat and water to drink for 10 days. Then to look at their countenance compared to those that took of the king's meat. The prince of the eunuchs agreed, and after 10 days, their appearance was fairer and fattier than those that had ate of the king's meat. So from that moment on, they received pulse and water. This is just the first example. God had blessed the four with wisdom and knowledge, and Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. The king found none like Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He found them to be ten times better than all the magicians and astrologers that was in his realm. In Daniel chapter 2, we see that King Nebuchadnezzar has a dream that only Daniel is able to interpret. The king made Daniel a great man, gave him many great gifts, and made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon. He was the chief of the governors over all the wise men of Babylon. Daniel requested that the king set Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego over the affairs of the province of Babylon. However, Daniel sat in the gate of the king. In Daniel chapter 3, King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold and he ordered everyone to come to the dedication. He said that whenever they heard all kinds of music, that they should fall down and worship the golden image. And whoever did not fall down and worship the image should be cast into the fiery furnace. There were Chaldeans that came unto the king saying that there were some Jews that were not bowing down to worship the image. It was. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men have not regarded you, and they serve not our gods, nor do they worship the golden image. So in his rage, Nebuchadnezzar commanded to bring them before him. Nebuchadnezzar questioned them, and they simply said that their God is a deliverer. And he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. But if not, be it known that we will not serve your gods, nor worship the golden image. In his fury, he commanded that they should heat the furnace one seven times more than it was. They bound Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and cast them into the fiery furnace. The furnace was so hot that it slew the men that took them up. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego fell down in the midst of the furnace. Nebuchadnezzar was astonished and said, Did we not throw three men into the furnace? I see four men walking around, and they are not hurt, and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. Nebuchadnezzar called them forth, and there was no harm done unto them. They didn't even smell like fire. Then the king spoke and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who have sent his angel and delivered his service that trusted. They trusted in him. They didn't bow. They trusted in him. And have changed the king's word and yielded their bodies that they might not serve nor worship any god except their own. Therefore, I make a decree that every people, nation, and language will speak anything amiss against the god of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be cut in pieces, and their houses shall be made a dunghill. 
because there is no other God that can deliver after this sort. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So we see here that even the king had to acknowledge who God was. So much so that he said if anybody came against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they would be killed. Even he could see that there was no other God like the one true God. He was able to accept God for who he was because they refused to compromise. They refused to conform. Now, my question is, can people see God in you? In Daniel chapter 6, we find Daniel, who is now serving under King Darius. Still, Daniel was preferred above the presidents and princes because he had an excellent spirit within him. The presidents and princes plotted against Daniel concerning the kingdom, but they could find anything against him. They came up with the idea to use his own God against him. They went to King Darius and consulted together to establish a royal statute. If any man prayed to God for 30 days, they would be cast into the lion's den. Daniel knew of this decree, but even so, he went into his house with his windows opened and kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed. They went to King Darius and told him that Daniel regarded him not, nor respected the decree that he had signed. When the king heard these words, he was displeased with himself. The king held Daniel in high regard. Since this decree could not be broken, Daniel was thrown into the lion's den. Then King Darius came unto Daniel and asked him, was his God able to deliver him from the lions? Daniel responded that God sent his angels and had shut the lion's mouth. They did not hurt him. King Darius was overjoyed and commanded that they remove Daniel from the lion's den. There was no hurt found upon him because he believed in his God. Again, Daniel did not conform. Daniel did not bow. The king commanded that they would bring them in that had accused Daniel and cast them into the lion's den, as well as their children and wives. King Darius made a decree that every man within his kingdom would tremble in fear before the God of Daniel, for he is the living God. He delivers and rescues and works signs and wonders in heaven and on earth. Again, in this situation, King Darius, this is the second king. The second king had to acknowledge God for who and what he truly was. They refused to bow. They refused to take down from the statues that God had set before them. There was this pastor and wife that stood in the pulpit and said, it didn't matter if one of them was wrong. They were going to stand beside each other no matter what. God has not called us to stand beside our loved ones in their wrongdoings. I have a relative that knew her husband had backsliding. He was cheating on her. He was running the members away from the church, among other things. Like, he was getting book wild out here. Yet, she continued to support him while he pastored, while he ran revivals. And he was also out here laying hands on people. Let's go to Acts chapter 5. We come across Ananias and Sapphira. At this time... The people had been filled with the Holy Ghost 
they were of one mind and one soul, and they had all things in common. There were none that lacked, for as many as had lands and houses sold them and brought the prices of those things and laid them at the apostles' feet. So they was helping each other. Everything was distributed according to every man's need. Ananias and his wife Sapphira sold their possession and kept back part of the price. Sapphira knew what her husband had done and she knew what he was about to do. Ananias brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. Peter asked, Ananias, why have you lied to the Holy Ghost and kept back part of the price of the land? While it remained, was it not your own? And after it was sold, was it not in your own power? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You have not lied to men, but you have lied unto God. After Ananias heard those words, he fell down and gave up the ghost. The young men rose and carried him out and buried him. Three hours later, here comes his wife Sapphira, not knowing what had happened to Ananias. Peter asked her, Was this how much you sold the land for? She said, Yes, for so much. Peter said, How is it that you have agreed together to tempt the Spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of them which have buried your husband are at the door and shall carry you out. She fell down at his feet and gave up the ghost. And the young men came in, carried her out, and buried her beside her husband. I've seen people get mad because there are parents that will not support their children, their homosexual children. They won't attend their weddings. I've seen parents that fully support their children in their wrongdoings. My question is, Who do you think God will be pleased with? In the book of 1 Samuel, we come across the prophet Eli. In chapter 1, Eli encounters Hannah, who will give birth to the prophet Samuel. Hannah keeps her promise that if God would allow her to have a son, she will give him back to God. When Samuel is old enough, he goes to live with Eli. Eli had two sons of his own, Hophni and Phinehas. They knew not the Lord. They were crooked and their sin before God was great. Now the custom was that when any man made a sacrifice, the priest's servants came with a flesh hook. While the flesh was seething, they would strike it, and whatever the flesh hook brought up belonged to the priest. But his sons were taken more than that what they should. The sons of Eli made the men hate the offering of the Lord. Now Eli was very old and had heard all the things that his sons were doing. They were even sleeping around with the women. A man of God came unto Eli and he gave him a word. I said indeed that your house and the house of your father will walk before me forever. However, Now be it far from me. I will cut off your hand in the arm of your father's house, so that there shall not be an old man in your house. The man that I do not cut off shall be to consume your eyes and to grieve your heart, and all in the increase of your house shall die in the flower of their age. And this shall be a sign unto you that shall come upon your two sons. In one day, they both shall die, and I will raise me up a faithful priest that shall do according to that which is in my heart and in my mind. 
and I will build him at your house, and he shall walk before me forever. Samuel answered God's call, and God began to speak to Samuel. 1 Samuel 3, 12 through 14. In that day, I'll perform against Eli all things which I have spoken concerning his house. When I begin, I will also make an end. For I have told him that I will judge his house forever for the iniquity, singing, for the iniquity which he knoweth, because his sons made themselves vow, and he restrained them not. And therefore I have sworn into the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be purged with sacrifice nor offering forever. Now Eli, knowing that God had called Samuel, asked Samuel what God had said. At first, Samuel was afraid to tell him, but he told Eli everything that was said. Samuel grew, and the Lord was with him. During the battle with the Philistines, the sons of Eli were slain, and the ark of God was taken. When Eli received the news that his sons were slain and the ark of God was taken, he fell back off his seat and broke his neck and died. His son, Phineas's wife, went into labor when she heard the ark was taken and that her husband and Eli had died. Before she died, she named the child Ichabod. The glory has departed from Israel. There are many more examples that I could use, but I believe that I have given you enough so that you can understand. God will never put us in a situation that will cause us to go against his word. I don't care what nobody say. If you in politics and it is causing you to uphold the very things that God is against, God has not put you there. People will make all kinds of excuses for why they do what they do. They not only justify their sins, they justify the sins of others. You justify sin more than you justify the word of God. God has called us out. There will be no excuse when we stand before the Lord on that day. We are not called to be partakers of sin. Until next time, you guys, take care.